fearlessness is jumping off of the cliff without thinking. Courage is acknowledging your fear, analyzing the consequences, and deciding you still care so much about it, you're gonna take one step forward anyway. I was buried in tuition payments. I was all out of bar mitzvah cash. So there had to be a way to make some quick money. So two nights before final exams, my freshman year of college, I find tickets to The Price is Right. I believe faith, no matter what your religion is, faith in the idea that it's going to work out in the end isn't useful, it's necessary. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up, Believe Nation? It's Evan. My one word is believe, and I believe in you. I believe you have Michael Jordan level talent at something, and I want you to find it, embrace it, and use it to make a difference. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew in today's lessons from a man who went from dropping out of college to then going on to interview some of the most successful people in the world and becoming a best selling author himself. He's Alex Benayan and here's my take on his top 10 rules of success. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, take the third door. So after spending seven years studying the world's most successful people, I realized while on the surface, you know, Maya Angelou and Steve Wozniak might be completely different. At the core, their stories are the exact same. And there's almost this common melody to it. And the analogy that came to me is that they treat life, business, and success just like a nightclub. There's always three ways in. There's the first door where 99% of people wait in line hoping to get in. And that's where the line curves around the block, right? And then there's the second door, the VIP entrance, where the billionaires and the celebrities go through. And school has this way of making you feel like those are the only two ways in, right? You either wait your turn or you're born into it. But what I've learned and what you know is that there's always, always the third door. And it's the entrance where you jump out of line, run down the alley, bang on the door a hundred times, crack open the window, go through the kitchen, there's always a way in. And it doesn't matter if that's how Bill Gates sold his first piece of software or how Lady Gaga got her first record deal. They all took the third door. Rule number two, be courageous. One of the biggest and most surprising lessons I learned on this journey was that I just had this assumption that all these people I looked up to were fearless. You know, Elon Musk or Bill Gates, we just assume they, you know, have no fear in it's how they achieve what they've done. But what I've learned is that not a single one of them were fearless. They actually were filled with tremendous amount of fear. Mm. So while they weren't fearless, they did have tremendous amounts of courage. And the difference between fearlessness and courage is that fearlessness is jumping off of the cliff without thinking. Courage is acknowledging your fear, analyzing the consequences, and deciding you still care so much about it, you're gonna take one step forward anyway. Rule number three, my personal favorite, be resourceful. I had a problem where I had this dream, I thought the easy part would be getting to Bill Gates, the hard part I figured was getting the money to fly there. <laughs> I was buried in tuition payments, I was all out of bar mitzvah cash, so there had to be a way to make some quick money. So two nights before final exams, my freshman year of college, I find tickets to The Price is Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and my first thought is, you know, what if I go on the show and win some money to fund this dream? Yeah. You know, not my brightest moment. But I had a problem, I'd never seen a full episode of the show before. Okay. I'd only seen bits and pieces, so that night I decided to do the logical thing and pull an all-nighter to study. Okay. okay, but I didn't study for finals. I studied how to hack the prices right. And I went on the show the next day and did this ridiculous strategy and ended up winning the whole showcase showdown, winning a sailboat, selling a sailboat, and that's how I funded the book. Rule number four, define success for yourself. How do we define success? Can a bus driver on the street be defined as successful and the guy who's the CEO of that business not successful? So when I started out on this journey, I had the same definition of success as almost everyone, which is I thought, you know, the more powerful you are, the more wealthy you are, the more successful you are. You know, the Forbes list idea. It wasn't until I met Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple Computers, that he completely redefined my understanding of success. He helped me realize that, you know, if you put Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak side by side, most people will say Steve Jobs was more successful. But Wozniak helped me realize 
that success has much more to do with how you define it, how you look within yourself and ask yourself, what do I actually want? What makes me happy? And if what makes you happy is driving a bus and coming home at 5 p.m. and picking up your kids and playing catch with them, and you're the CEO of a company and never see your kids, you're not successful. If you're miserable, if you're not doing what you wanna do, that's not success. So should we broaden ideas of what it means? Is our, is our definition flawed? I believe that the natural human and really Western definition of success, which is more money, more power, more prestige, isn't right. Look, it might be right for some people who want that, but for the vast majority of people who want to be, you know, a mother and working and helping at their kid's school or a father who wants to be, you know, involved with their community. I think the idea of the more Twitter followers you have and the more money you have is a flawed model. You have to look within yourself and ask yourself what you want. Rule number five, survive rejections. What makes this book so interesting, man, is, is your story of trying to put it together, mm. which is at least as powerful as the stories in the book, if not, in some cases, more powerful. So how did you deal with rejection? Oh my God, horribly. You know, because pretty much the whole book at some points feels like this long string of me getting my ass beat, you know? <laughs> and dealing with that rejection, I realize is not only a part of the entrepreneurial journey, mm. it is the entrepreneurial journey. So how you deal with it is a lot more interesting than how you got your win. Because everybody will get their win in a different way, but how you deal with the rejection in many ways is a universal act. And what I've learned is that I do two things. One, when I'm getting beat up, and doors are just being slammed in my face over and over and over again, and I have nothing left, the only thing that keeps me, because I've thought about quitting, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, I've thought about, you know, is this worth it? The only thing that would keep me going was that larger belief that we talked about in the beginning of it's not about me. There'll be points on my journey where I would be, you know, up at 4 a.m., sleeping at midnight, just pounding the pavement. And after you know getting rejected over and over and over again with that kind of lifestyle, you lose your spirit of what started it. Mm. And it was my best friends that would save me. And they would be like, dude, tomorrow, like I'm taking your phone. We're going, you know, on an adventure. We're going, you know, whatever it was. And in many ways, that was like my emotional reset, which saved me over and over and over again. Rule number six, make things happen. A friend of mine who was helping me actually try to get to Bill Gates said, look, I'll help you get to Bill Gates, but you should also talk to Chilu. Mm -hmm. And I trusted him and I went in and I found out that here's this guy. Grew up in a village outside of Shanghai, China with no running water, no electricity. His village was so poor that people walked around with deformities from malnutrition. But he was a smart guy and he worked really hard and he got into a good university and by the age of 27, he was making the most money he's ever made in his life, $7 a month. Now fast forward 20 years later and he's the president of Microsoft. He is single-handedly one of the most inspiring guys and the way he's impacted me the most, he's taught me a lot of lessons, he's taught me not just about success, he's taught me about relationships, about luck and its role and about preparation and about opportunity and about He's taught me the most crazy sleeping hacks and <laughs> diets, and right. he's an incredibly inspiring guy. Wow. But the biggest thing he taught me is that he said the most beautiful thing. You would think someone who grew up in those circumstances would be very down on his life and the cards he was dealt. Look, I am very aware, and I even told him in the interview, I'm aware I grew up in Los Angeles in the United States with running water and electricity and public schools. And when Chi Lu grew up with his public schools, for every 500 students, there was one school teacher. So I'm sitting with Chi and he says the most incredible thing. He goes, 
every time I go to a movie with my daughter, I think, oh my God, I'm in a movie theater. And it's such an incredible way to live life. And for someone who's been, who was dealt extremely hard cards, he said the most beautiful thing. He goes, in some ways, life, God, the universe, or whatever you want to call it, is extremely fair. Everybody has 24 hours in a day. Some might be born with a silver spoon and some might be born in a village, but there's an equalizer and we all have 24 hours. So it doesn't matter if you're a peasant or if you're the president, you have 24 hours in a day and it's up to you how you're gonna spend that. Rule number seven, have faith. I believe faith, no matter what your religion is, faith in the idea that it's going to work out in the end isn't useful, it's necessary. Because if you move forward on a journey without some faith, whether it's in the universe or if it's in God, it's a very lonely and scary journey. And who knows what happens up above, but it feels a lot better believing that someone has your back. And you can't be a cockeyed optimist, or can you? Uh, you know, it helped me, but it also got me in a lot of trouble too. <laughs> Rule number eight, focus on your desires. You talk about turning the volume up on your dream. I wanna know what that really means. Like, what are you saying in your head? It's a brilliant metaphor. The notion that, okay, you've got all this noise, I'm gonna turn up the volume on my dream, it's gonna drown it out. But like, that the reality of that is what? So, this is the thing. I believe fully that every single person who's going out to chase their dreams has those voices in their head. I think it's part of the human experience. Whether it's fear or anxiety, whatever it may be, that's part of what it means to be a human being. So, you know, for me it was my parents coming to this country and sacrificing. For you it might be completely different. What I've learned in hindsight is that, not just with my story, with all these people who I studied, the key of taking that first step, the really daunting one, because the first one's always the hardest, as you know. It's not about trying to logically argue with those voices in our head. You will never win against the voices in your head if you try to argue with them. What I've learned is that if you, instead of focusing on the voices and the fears, you focus on the desires. And I think no matter what your dream is, if you're able to find a larger purpose, a larger impact that lives beyond you, all of a sudden all of your bullshit that's holding you down becomes a lot less relevant. Rule number nine, grab on to what you want. One of the best pieces of advice I got on this journey was the difference between a linear life and an exponential life. A linear life is you get an internship, you get a job, you get a promotion, you save up for a vacation, and you just go step by step, slowly and predictably your whole way through. And again, there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to be clear with yourself about what you want. An exponential life is about deciding that you're not gonna wait around, you're not gonna hope someone just, you know, hands you what you're hoping for, and it's about grabbing onto it for what you want. So if you look at Steven Spielberg, the way he did it was, he was rejected from film school. So instead of giving up on his dream, he decided he would take his education into his own hands. So the way the story goes, according to Spielberg, is that one day when he was around 19 years old, he jumped onto a tour bus at Universal Studios rides around the lot on this tour, jumps off the bus, hides in the bathroom, waits for the bus to drive away, and starts walking around the lot. And as he's walking around, he bumps into this man named Chuck Silvers, who works at Universal Television. And Chuck Silvers sees this kid and says, what are you doing here? And Spielberg tells him his dream. And they end up talking for a while, and Silvers goes, you wanna come back on the lot? Spielberg goes, that would be a dream. And Chuck Silvers writes a three-day pass. And Spielberg goes every day back to the lot for the next three days, but on the fourth day, Spielberg puts on a suit, gets his dad's briefcase, walks up to the security entrance, puts a hand in the air and goes, hey, Scotty, and Scotty just waves back and Spielberg walks right through. And for the next you know, months, Spielberg goes back onto the lot, going into editing rooms, learning as much as possible, sneaking onto sets and soaking it all in, really creating his own education. He's asking producers out to lunch, talking to actors and actresses, but eventually Chuck Silvers, who became his mentor, gave him one of the best pieces of advice. He essentially said, stop schmoozing and go make a quality short film that you can have in your hand and show to people. 
And it sort of busts that myth of it's not, you know, what you know, it's who you know. It's really also what you know or what you have to show. So Spielberg takes the advice to heart, makes this incredible short film called Amblin. And when Chuck Silver sees it, he's so moved that a single teardrop falls down his face. And Chuck Silver reaches for the phone and calls the vice president of Universal Television, Sid Sheinberg. And he goes, Sid, I have something you have to see. And Sid goes, look, I have a lot to watch right now. Is it that important? And Chuck Silver goes, it's that goddamn important. If you don't watch this tonight, someone else will. Scheinberg watches the film, the next day says he wants to see Spielberg immediately, and gives him a seven-year contract on the spot. And that's how he became the youngest director in Hollywood history. And rule number 10, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is burn your ships. So there's this very famous story from Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, where a general a long, long time ago takes his troops on a few boats and sails to an island for a battle. And as the troops get off the, get off the boat and the general goes out to survey his enemy, the general sees that the enemy is outnumbering his troops 10 to 1. So he comes up with a strategy. The general lines up his troops, lights a match, and sets the ships on fire. And by burning the ships, he gives his troops an option. Either you win or you die. And sure enough, they won. And when it comes to burning your ships in your life, this is the most personal part because this is when you're almost at the end of your journey. This is the part that makes the difference between chasing a dream and achieving your dream. And only you, deep down, know what your version of burning your ships are. So I wanna challenge you, when you're at that final point of your journey, make it your final bullet, go all chips in, and when you get to that point, burn your ships. Now I've got two really special bonus clips from Alex on how to be patient and find your true path that I think you're really gonna enjoy. But before that, I wanna make sure we're taking action, not just watching another video. So it's time for the three questions. Write them down for yourself, talk about them with a friend, or leave your answers in the comments below. Here we go. Question number one, what is your definition of success? Question number two, how can you take the third door to reach your success? And question number three, what will you do to keep the faith when you feel low? Thank you guys so much for watching. I believe in you. I hope you continue to believe in yourself and whatever your one word is. Much love. See you soon and enjoy the bonus clips. Who is the hardest to get to? Bill Gates took two years and my entire focus was on him. It went to the point where I was 18 and 19 years old and I had pictures of him taped up above my bed, on my car dashboard. It was my number one dream and it took an entire two years of work to make it happen. So all this book took how many years? It was a seven year journey. So it was about four years of doing all the interviews and then another three years of writing it as a narrative to make it a page turning. What was it that was driving you in all of this? You know, when I first started, to understand like why I was going through this crisis at the beginning that led me on this journey was you have to know that I'm the son of Jewish immigrants, mm. which pretty much means I came out of the womb, my mom cradled me in her arms, and then she stamped MD on my ass and just sent me on my way. <laughs> you know, I'm like, in third grade, I wore scrubs to school for Halloween. Mm. You know, I was that kid. And by the time I got to college, I remember really quickly, you know, I was the pre-med of pre-meds, but I remember lying on my dorm room bed, staring up at the ceiling, and looking at this stack of biology books, feeling like they were sucking the life out of me. And at first I just wondered, maybe I'm being lazy. But then I began to question, maybe I'm not on my path. Maybe I'm on a path somebody placed me on and I'm just rolling down. So not only am I going through this what I wanna do with my life crisis, that's when the question started to evolve to, mm -hmm. you know, how did Bill Gates, when nobody knew his name, sell software out of his dorm room? Or how did Lady Gaga, without a single hit under her belt, get her first record deal? These are the things they don't only teach you in school. So I just did what? I thought was normal, I just went to the library or went on Amazon and just ripped through books. You know, business books, self-help books, biographies. 
but eventually I was left empty handed. And that's when my very you know, naive 18 year old thinking kicked in and I thought, well, if no one's gonna write the book I'm dreaming of reading, why not write it myself? Raise your standard. Apple at the core, its core value is that we believe that people with passion can change the world for the better. Not one drop of my self-worth depends on your acceptance of me. I don't ever give up. I'd have to be dead or completely incapacitated. Hey, Believe Nation, if you want to see my all-time favorite top 10 rules of success, I have a very special secret video for you. These are the individual clips that I have personally learned the most from and applied to my life and my business. Check the link in the description for details.